and uh, <laughs> uh, I got distracted. Welcome to the Unknown Webcast. This is just a bit of a trigger warning uh, yeah. for those who are those who oh, are really lost it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, those who believe words are more injurious than sticks and stones. I really am so conservative. I can't turn left even when I'm driving. In addition to giving trigger warnings to our viewers, Ron Hensel and I both drink coffee for your protection. This is our this week our apologist and uh, novelist Brian James Godawa joins us to talk about Cruel Logic, the book. My name is Don Vino. I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in Wonder Lake, Illinois, which produces the Unknown Webcast. And our senior researcher is Ron Hensel, who will introduce the yeah. sponsors of today's webcast. And here is Ronnie Baby. Greetings from sunny Florida, where the palm tree came out, saw its shadow, and now we have 12 more months of summer. Our sponsor for this edition of the Unknown Webcast is World's End Theology Outlet, your one-stop resource for half-baked heresies, dubious doctrines, and other ideas whose time is gone. World's End Theology Outlet, our regular legal disclaimer. Our guest on today's webcast, insert here, that would be Brian J. Gattawa, has no connection whatsoever to any of the satirical content of the Unknown Webcast, you're after referred to as the webcast, although we probably will not mention it again. This satirical content includes any and all commercials, end credits, puns, smart remarks, or anything else that might fall under the definition of satire. In the meantime, Midwest Christian Outreach Inc. bears no liability for or responsibility for anyone's opinions regarding this satirical content. Our regular notices, the opinions expressed on this webcast are ours and should be yours too. If, if, if you enjoy it or if you find it really annoying um, and you want to inflict it on someone else, uh, to ensure your continued access, please go to MidwestOutreach.org, click the yellow donate button and contribute as you feel it. And as you do, never fear. This webcast is Y2K compliant. And don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite video channels. And now we introduce our special guest to our studio audience, Mr. Brian Gattawa. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, here we finally found someone who really gets into the, the attention and the affirmation. <laughs> we were hoping that that would happen. That was, the, that was the whole goal. So we used to have fake, fake applause where I held up my fingers and went, <sighs> but now we have real fake now applause. Have real fake applause. applause. Actual fake applause. applause. It's <laughs> the best kind. So, all right. Brian J. Gattawa, what is so cruel about logic and why is it a white supremacist invention? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is uh, to me, this is kind of going to be uh, fun because we've never had just a novelist, a novel novel. It's a novel, right? it's a novel idea. To... It's a novel idea because we really deal more with, okay, worldviews, uh, non Christian religions, cults. Uh, and uh, and apologetics, but as it turns out, Brian is an apologist and uh, writes novels. He's very unapologetic about that. So no, 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 and and he has intertwined apologetics with the story. So my question, Brian, is what prompted you to attempt to do a novel like this? Well, that's a little bit of a story. Um, Actually, I have a background as a Hollywood screenwriter. So I wrote Ooh. the movie Cell Wars many years ago with Kiefer Sutherland. And, Which what um, movie was that? I'm sorry. It's called To End All Wars. Oh, okay. okay. You can see it on Pro Amazon Prime right now with wow. Kiefer Sutherland. And it was sort of the, the chariots of fire for the new millennium when it came out. And, um, you know, secular movie with a Christian worldview. And since then, I made a few other, some documentaries and a few other uh, low-budget feature movies. More recently, I actually wrote the script for the political satire, My Son Hunter, which is a uh, huh. dark tale about Hunter Biden's laptop. <laughs> and uh, it was not a documentary. It was actually a political satire on the level of like the big, sh uh, the big short or Wolf of Wall Street, that kind of a thing. Huh. So as a screenwriter, um, you know, I've developed many stories along, along the way. Um, so most of them don't get made as movies, you know, that's part of the business. Yeah. But I've also been a, um, uh, always, I've always been in love with apologetics. Um, in, in my Christian life, I have actually grown. A lot of my Christian growth is studying Christian apologetics. Why? Because it 
it addresses head on the questions, skeptical uh, issues, doubts, things that that I can relate to as as a, th a thinking person, you know, um, seeking out answers to problems and issues that uh, seem to be apparently there in the Bible as you as you're reading it and as you're growing in your Christian faith. So I've always kind of love to find, seek for answers and and hear both sides of the of the story, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and along that way, I had uh, many, many years ago, I had been listening to a, a famous Christian apologist named Walter Martin. Uh, was it? He was back in the 70s. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. We, we, know, we know that. I used to get his cassette tapes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was actually listening to his cassette tape where he was on the Long John Nebel show in the 60s, right? Oh. And he was, he was just, just, you know, I'm, I'm working out the gym and stuff and, and listening to him. And he's describing, he was describing in one of these shows, you know, his frustration with an atheist who he was debating, trying to explain to atheists that, you know, you have no foundation for, mor for your morality. Your atheism doesn't provide you any kind of uh, legitimacy to moral claims whatsoever. And the atheist would be, what are you talking about? I, I believe in moral right, moral things. I, I believe morality. I believe right and wrong. And not, you know, the, not the question, not the question. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and he's like, you know, he gets so frustrated but trying to show him, yeah, but you don't have a foundation for that. So you're contradicting your own belief system. So he got so frustrated. He just said, okay. He thought of this illustration. It's 1940s Germany. I'm a Nazi prisoner guard with a gun pointed at you and you're a Jew. Give me one reason why I shouldn't kill you. And it, 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 it was a way of incarnating a, really a, a philosophical argument in a very human dramatic way that, that brought the point home that um, about, you know, the, the reality of these moral foundations. And I think that's the power of storytelling. A story can, and Jesus told parables, right? So, you know, parables, stories embody um, sort of conflict of worldviews that we have in the world and showing which worldview would be superior to the others. And um, so I never forgot that. And uh, through the years, I, you know, have been pursuing my you know, screenwriting career. And I came up with this idea inspired by that of, for a movie called Cruel Logic. And the idea was that there's this brilliant serial killer. In fact, he's a professor of philosophy and he's at a college. And he captures university professors and he debates them. And the topic of the debate is his moral right to kill them. So he'll capture some evolutionary biologist or queer theorist or you, you name it and, and, and turns the video on and, and says, okay, give me one. If what you say is true about reality, give me one valid reason why I should not kill you and I'll let you go. So he's using this ruthless rationality or, or like I call it, cruel logic, right, to, to deconstruct their various worldviews. And, of course, it's, it's, um, it's not too revealing to say that they don't do a very good job of, of defending <laughs> themselves. Um, but that was sort of the premise of the script. And I wrote that script, and it won – actually, it won awards – and I tried to get it made as a movie, and, and I, I could never do it. You know, um, there's a million reasons why a movie movie can't get made, and why a movie can get made, and it's a yeah. miracle that any movies actually do get made. So mm. that doesn't mean it's not a it's not a good story. And I kept on, I held on to it all these years. And when I began writing novels about eleven, oh, no, twelve years ago, I actually started down the path of writing these Bible stories, uh, retold biblical stories true to the Bible, but filling in, you know, the, the, the in-between that, that the Bible doesn't talk about, you know, if you look at Moses life, you know, it's sort of poetic license telling, adding into the story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, you know, you, you hear about the birth of Moses, then you see 40 years later when he leaves. And then you see 40 years later when he returns, what happens all in the in-between, you know, that's the kind of thing. And, but I also bring in the supernatural spiritual warfare element of angels, demons, and watchers and all these bizarre things and stuff that are, are in the Bible. And uh, yeah, I use a little poetic license. So that's been my, my pathway, but I've always wanted to, to finally uh, translate this, this cruel logic script into a novel. And so I finally did last year okay. and, and um, it, I, I released it on September <clears throat> in September. And um, the, the heart of it is 
that same principle of the killer, but it's but it's also in the context of a, a modern woke university. So back when I originally wrote it, uh, we were we were not aware of what was going on in university with all the wokeness and the postmodernism, and a lot of it had still been sort of, you know, under the covers and and um, you know. Pe they were teaching it, but it wasn't getting out. Yeah. And now that it's got out and it's infiltrated into all the institutions, right? And and so I've I've seen the importance of the university where the higher education is often where um, culture changes begin. You know, right. you get the academics who are teaching their philosophies and philosophies always changing and seeking new ways, I would argue, <laughs> seeking new ways to get rid of God from man. Uh, and philosophy uses uh, philosophical realm, economics seeks to do so mm -hmm. economically, all this. And, um, and postmodernity was the, the, the big, one of the, you know, Jordan Peterson talks a lot about this, how postmodernity mixed with Marxism sort of um, took over, uh, you know, with critical theory in, in the higher education system around the 60s or so. And Christopher Rufo writes on this. He's got an excellent book just came out called the, the American Cultural Revolution. And, and, as, and so they were teaching this postmodern rejection of, uh, absol of absolute truth, of objective reality. Um, and, and combined with that was a sort of cultural Marxism where it reinterprets the world in binary opposition of oppressed and oppressor. And the it defines the oppress the oppressor as white male Christian heterosexual etc. Mm -hmm. The the patriarchy. That's the definition, right? Yeah. I, I like what, to, back in nineteen eighty nine or ninety, I'm not sure. It might have been. It's somewhere between eighty nine and ninety one. I was working at a liberal seminary in the Chicago area. I was in the business office. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew every single student because I had to approve every student's registration, you know, because they had, we had to make sure they paid their bills, you know. And um, I also did student housing and student loans. Eventually, I did everything. So um, everything financial, I guess. And um, one day, a student, I, I saw them often, you know, they would come by. Usually, I saw a student more than just once a quarter or a semester, I'm sorry. And uh, one of them came by, and he was usually a very jovial student. Uh, and he, I could tell something was bugging him. And I said, what's the matter? And he goes, well, can't you tell? And I go, what? <laughs> you know? And he goes, and, and finally he says, look, just look at me. Just look at me. You can tell. I'm white, and I'm male. Everywhere I go, I oppress people. I can't help it. Now, this is like 1990. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, th this is around the first time I heard. Um, well, it was 1988 was when the, the article White Privilege, uh, Unpacking the uh, Unseen Knapsack was published by Peggy McIntosh. Right. Yeah. And uh, I was starting to hear this new definition of racism. This is 1990. Black people cannot be racist mm -hmm. because racism is always it has a component of power. And if it doesn't have power, then it's not racism. So all these new definitions were starting. And thankfully, I, I they we we kept on having these cutbacks and staff because they, they just didn't know how to manage a budget there. That's something there's something about being in a liberal seminary that keeps them they don't think money is real. It's like that Saturday Night Live sketch where Elizabeth Warren said, Well, here's the thing about money, it's not real, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, that's the way they all thought. They they literally did, you know, they literally thought money is, is just not necessary. Well, sadly it was, and because of that, I was one of three cuts, including the um including the, uh, uh, of all things, ironically, uh, the, the lady who was in charge of diversity at that time, they already had a diversity officer in 1990, you know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, they hadn't heard the words equity yet and inclusion, but so yeah. this was brewing. Uh, yeah. that, it was also at that seminary that I first heard the word homophobia first time. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I had to ask, well, what, what do you mean? You know? Um, and this is, so that was, you know, uh, 34, 33, 34 years ago, yeah. third of well, a century I, ago. 
I mean, actually, it began in the '60s, you know, with yeah. the critical oh, yeah. theorists uh, Max Horkheimer and and those guys, and then the the how a lot of them had come to America and began teaching with postmodernity yeah. in, in in the you know in Colombia and and every and everywhere. But but um, so yeah, so the oppressor oppressed uh, class, the oppressor is the white male mm -hmm. heterosexual Christian, and the oppressed is everybody else. It's Everybody <laughs> in a so-called uh, minority, whether it's but color, you, female, you forgot gay, to put cisgendered and straight in there, right? Or maybe you did, and I missed it. But yeah, because yeah. if you're not a straight white male, well, then you got some intersectionality going on. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, we see that now. Obviously, uh, that that worldview has captured all the institutions: government, the arts, media, everything, and um, it's 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 destroying. America. It's destroying the world because it's not just in America, of course. But nevertheless, my contention is, you know, that I've always believed, uh, following Francis Schaeffer, who argued that, you know, the 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 culture is affected by it begins in the in academia where the 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 um, scholars study and develop yeah. their ideas. Then yeah. they teach those ideas to the students. The students Philosophy, go theology, out. the arts, absolutely. Know, culture. Yeah. They go the out and, and they get jobs in the real world and they bring that idea, those yeah. ideas with them. And then the arts, you know, those of us in the arts, we do like to read a lot of philosophical things or a lot of ideas. And so a lot of artists get exposed to it. And then that comes out in the in the TV and movies and music, et cetera. So you, so, you started out, you know, when you first had the idea, there you weren't a aware of all the wokeness no quite so no. you must have when you said okay i'm going to take this screenplay and turn it into a novel and you were, oh, had become aware of mm -hmm. all the wokeness that must did you had you already had a good research background in things like cultural marxism and you know yeah just a little school? just a little um but in the course of writing a novel, you, of course, you do your research. And uh, actually, I also um, had to deal with the critical race theory, attempting to get, to get into my own church. So I did intensive research in order to deal with it. And that helped a lot. Mm. But um, yeah, so I wasn't aware of it when I first wrote it. But it actually makes the the story much more fuller because as you had indicated, it, it, it had always been there from the 60s onward anyway. Yeah, right. And, and this, this embodies one of the major themes of my novel, which is ideas have consequences. And what that means is, is you know, when you have a university that is teaching, there's no objective reality um, and uh, no knowable objective reality, right? And everything is oppressed into these arbitrary classes that have been determined by those in power. Ultimately, they believe that there is no there is no truth or or morality other than power. And so they really believe that power is well, power is their god. From a Christian worldview, you'd be saying right. power is their god. It's their deity, because. They'll do anything to achieve power. And that's when you understand that's the motivation of this worldview. That's how, why you understand the insanity of the things they say. They'll say insane things like a boy can become a girl, you know, these kinds of things to the normal person, scientific mind. It's like, this is insanity. How is it? Well, when yeah. they have their worldview of power, then anything justifies the twisting and manipulation of language in order to justify them overthrowing those they perceive in power and getting in power over them. So know? power is their God. But one of the worst, one of the big problems with white males is that they have power. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't that make us good? And one of the, one of the things they argue against is hierarchy because hierarchy assumes power, assumes a power structure, yeah. but, right. but at the same time, they're going after power. They're making power yeah. grabs all the time. Yeah. How does they are seeking to become the oppressor. And by the way, uh, logic is not uh, um, it's not particularly uh, important in this worldview. Logic becomes a tool to manipulate and justify, rationalize one's own prejudices, as Nietzsche would say. Um, they would they would so so to point out the hypocrisy or double standards. It doesn't mean they don't right. have double oh, yeah, standards. Yeah. They have it's, no standards. They just no have standards, power right. and like, uh, you have it and they want it. 
It's like, so. uh, was it earlier this earlier last year when somebody said, I don't care if the Hunter Biden laptop story was true. Yeah. I, I don't care. I, I, I don't care if it was the biggest lie on the, ever told on the face of the earth. I wanted I, I wanted that to be kept out of the media because there's no way Trump could get elected. You could tell all the lies you wanted as long as it kept Trump from being elected. Exactly. So they're driven by that worldview, right? And but there's something else that's a part of it. And you know, as 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 it always with all secular ideologies and worldviews, they all are ultimately founded on a negation or a rejection of the Christian God. And so that's their real ultimate goal, but which is why you see uh, now we even see it, but it's been going on in the university already, is an attack on Western civilization, right? Western civilization is the boogeyman. Western civilization is the patriarchy, misogyny, slavery, all that kind of stuff, all of which is, you know, lies. Right, but right, nevertheless, yeah. they they are, they so in the university, most all Western civilization requirements that had been, you know, in the university for, for decades are all gone now. So, yeah. um, and the reason why is, they want to get rid of civilization. They well, are literally want to and, and, and to do that, you have to get rid of history. Yeah, you have to get rid of everything, basically. But so, but but my contention is, but what is Western civilization founded on? Well, ultimately, it's Judeo Christianity. Now, yeah, there are some other mix, mixtures in there with Enlightenment components. You know, nothing's absolute and perfect but but nevertheless certainly the morality the notion of morality itself is is founded on judeo christian morality so ultimately they are seeking to destroy god to get rid of god in the culture and in society and, and everything and when you get rid of god there's a lot ideas have consequences when you teach some people that they are just evolved animals in a tr chance universe morality is a social construct Mm -hmm. It's no surprise that students will begin to behave violently as animals without sure. morals, uh, you know, and, and what do we see now? We see students rising up, promoting genocide uh, in America, promoting genocide of Jews in, a, in, a, in the 20th century, 21st century, right? They're actually doing this. And why is it? Because they've been taught this, this worldview and ideas have consequences. And so I wanted to bring that to totality uh, picture uh, to light. What's going on in the universities, how it affects people. So one of my main characters is actually a young evangelical student, a uh, freshman, first year, Danny is his name. And, and he's, you know, he's a, he's a basic evangelical Christian and he goes to, to the college and he gets caught up in it. He gets manipulated and caught up in the social justice movement. And it show it takes him down that pathway of what we now hear is called Christian deconversion or Christian right. deconstruction. Um, of course, uh, people have lost, lost their faith going to colleges forever, right? So that's not unusual. Yeah. But, you know, nevertheless, we have this new term and it's being touted a lot by c celebrities who've lost their faith and all this. So I wanted to wrestle with this idea of what happens when you get rid of God and what are the consequences of it on a personal level, on a societal level, you know, and, and in terms of knowledge and, and, and knowledge institutions, mm -hmm. right? And so um, all that's kind of going on. And I, I told a story where everything that occurs in the university, whether it's the annual sex week that they have or um, the way the students are uh, engaging in uh, protests and attacking uh, professors, the way the administration is using DEI to uh, oppress other people, basically. Um, all that stuff I wanted to be based and rooted in reality. So I actually end up footnoting some of the novel just so people can realize the most crazy things are actually rooted are not made up by me. They're actually from the that's, newspaper headlines. That's, uh, so that's unusual for a novel to have, uh, you know, real world based footnotes. That's unusual. Yeah. yeah, I did that because it's just so crazy that, and I wanted, oh, the other reason it was too, was I have professors in the classes, teaching classes, and, you know, I give little snippets of it, you know, um, like I said, whether it's a queer theorist or an evolutionary biologist or, you know, what have you. Um, and, and I wanted to actually have them teach from real world material. So I'll have them quote like Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins or, you know, Evel uh, Stephen Jay Gould. So I'll actually have them be quoting from some of these famous atheists and, and uh, secularists 
um, to sort of show these, this is the, this is the philosophy that we're dealing with. And I didn't want people now, to blame me for plagiarism. So I, I made sure. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, I that, noted those. Now, you, you might have to resign, uh, uh, you know, yeah. as a white male, but. So uh, what does we, this all uh, have to do with a serial killer? Well, in my <laughs> mind, a well, serial well, killer. Hold on, hold on. I, I need to say something. So hold that. Cause we want to come back to that. Uh, uh, why was I interested in this? Well, I read a lot. Most of my reading time is invested in what do other religions believe? What do atheists believe? What do cults believe? I go to things like the Parliament of the World's Religions, and I hang around with you know 8,500 relig uh, people from religions around the planet and talk to them. I go to Paganicon and I hang out with the witches and Wiccans and Satanists and talk with them. Uh, so when I am not doing that and I just want to read something, I read something not necessarily religious. And I gravitate towards sort of dystopian books or uh, serial killer books, kind of like this. Uh, and your title intrigued me. Now, if one, one of the things is when I teach, I always bring in the idea or often bring in the idea that when you're reading something, watching a film, reading news sources, uh, watching news on television, you have to ask, what's the worldview of the person who's giving you the information? Because that's going to taint how they present their story. Yeah. Right. They're trying to, they're, they're unwittingly maybe, or intentionally trying to persuade you to change your worldview for there. So ask that question. That is really important. Uh, most people don't realize that. And when you start explaining it to them and they start watching, in fact, I used to teach uh, high school students before they mm -hmm. went to college. Uh, I would go down for a weekend to Cortez, Colorado, and I would go through all of this. What's the worldview? How does it work? And then I would say, okay, now we're going to watch a film. We're going to have a Sunday afternoon film watch, get the popcorn, get the pop. And um, uh, there was a film, I have to remember the title of it, that we would watch that have three specific worldviews in it. Uh, and you have to figure out what the worldviews are and tell me who the best worldview is, what the worst worldview is, and what is the most honorable one. And it's about a race across the desert. The best worldview, it turns out, is the animistic worldview, American <laughs> Indian. The worst worldview is the Christians. They are liars, connivers, and thieves. Of course. The most honorable worldview is the muslim who gives a uh, hat tip to the animistic guy they were shocked when they saw that in the film that way and we yeah. see it all the time so i was sort of interested then in what you're doing because you're saying okay the christian worldview is superior and here's how we see it play itself out in this scenario yeah yeah, that was the apologetics angle. But there's sure. also another component to that. See, I all although I've loved apologetics and philosophy for mo all, all my Christian life, um, I, I recognize that not, not all Christians do. Sometimes it's over their head. Sometimes they just don't like it or it's intellectual or it's boring, whatever. Uh, and, and, and I don't say this in terms of uh, judgment. It's like people are created differently and uh, not all people are interested in things like philosophy. And a lot of times I can see why. Um, but I also want to help people understand and appreciate it and realize, well, whether or not you like it, it's changing the world, right? So yeah. I thought, well, what would be one of the best ways to combine my loves and interests, which is entertainment <clears throat> and, you know, serial killer movies like Silence of the Lambs and my interest in philosophy and apologetics. And that was where the two perfectly sort of fit together, where it places the apologetics within an entertaining narrative co uh, context that allows a person to learn a little bit and push their push the uh, push their you know their brains a little bit, but not so much that it's it's this you know you're reading some kind of a textbook by any means you know. Right. Um, it also has the thrilling component, uh, the thriller component, and will they catch the the criminal? Will he get away? Uh, you know that kind of thing. All, all the the tension of people who are seeking who have to defend their lives, defend their beliefs with their very mm -hmm. lives, right? Or no, defend their lives with their very beliefs, whatever. Right, um, right, just right, that right, right. element is very interesting and entertaining, regardless of the apologetic element of it. So it's both of those components are sort of going on at the same time with cruel logic. And that that's where I think so far I've I've been encouraged to hear from people that they are picking 
picking it up that way. And that's, hmm. that's a good thing. Well, we were talking about CRT and, um, and uh, deconstructing your faith and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And one of the, something that is happening a lot with that these days is those who are progressives deconstructing their faith. They still want to sort of appeal to the Bible, yes, they do. but they don't really like what it says. And one of our no. sponsors yeah. actually addresses yes. that. Yeah. Our, our friends at world world's end theology outlet, your one-stop resource or have big heresies, dubious doctrines and other ideas whose time is gone has some questions for you. Are you still trying to figure out how to clean up in the ministry business? Do you want to finally learn how to get to the bottom of growing a successful church? Would you like to flush away your failures and start having your best church now? Well, then you need Charlatan Ultra Soft because nothing says theologically soft like Charlatan Ultra Soft. And in the, in the, even in these days of COVID, there's never any shortage of this. It's been personally tested by the man himself. It provides comfort where it counts. It wipes away even the most stubborn orthodoxy. And it comes with a money-back guarantee. If it doesn't work, just bring it back. And okay, keep those butts in the pews with Charlatan Ultra Soft from World's End Theology Outlet. So we got to pay the bills. In any case, <clears throat> you know, I didn't um, know anything about this world of script writing and, uh, you know, trying to get your, you know, sell your scripts so or however you get it produced into a movie until several, several years ago. I didn't realize there was a man in my church who was actually doing that. <laughs> he was um, he, he was um, a computer programmer by day and by night he was working on all these different scripts and. Uh, he would he would get really excited because apparently you, you get through this stage and then you get through that stage. And I think he submitted, you, you mentioned that your screenplay won some kind of award. And I think maybe one of his did too. I don't, I don't know how many different awards there are for screenplays or yeah. how many different people make these awards. And uh, he, he never got one. I mean, he, there were times we thought he was like that close and then yeah. something fell through. Yeah. Uh, so it's a different world. But, you know, I, I guess this raises a couple of questions in my mind. So I'll ask them both at once and you can answer them. Uh, uh, first of all, um, the um, maybe it just is one question. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to, I mean, what you also introduced here is the idea of taking a screenplay and turning it into a novel. And I know it's been done before. But very often it's done after the film is made, if if it works that way, or simultaneously, the, it comes out as both a, a movie and a book. Yeah, uh, that happens as well. The idea of gee, I tried to sell this as a as a movie, now I'm going to just put it out as a book. And of course, maybe do you think maybe it could still be a movie? Maybe this will help it become a movie. Who knows? Um, maybe. But in terms of influencing culture, um, it sounds like maybe you think that films would be or these days are the way the culture is primarily being influenced as opposed to books is that why you chose uh, it first or is it no no i i think they're both equally e you know it's funny you say that because uh i just i just have always loved movies and i i just yeah it's just who i am you know i've yeah, okay. I've, I've been an artist and i've always loved movies more than anything but i also have loved books like when I was younger, I actually read a ton more than I even read now. But but um, I think they're both equally influential. I, there was a time when I didn't think that, where I was thinking, oh, come on, you know, this is a visual world. You know, right. for, for better or worse and mostly worse, I think people don't read books anymore. They're, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're watching videos and YouTube and all this stuff and the attention span. And I believe all that's, there's a real component to that. But I was shocked to, to find out when I started writing my novels and started selling them and market them, marketing them, and they took off. Mm -hmm. And now, even mm -hmm. now, I'm like, I'm writing novels about Bible stories and I'm like, I dominate the top 10 lists really? of a couple different categories, Christian, biblical fiction and such. And people are hungry for, for it. But, but my point is, is that there, I, I sell a lot of books and I sell a lot of physical books. I also thought people would buy more digital because it's cheaper and it's the way yeah. of the future. And I, I embrace it. I got rid of all my physical I, books. I like, I like digital books, but yeah. 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 And I, 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 I understand that, you know, everybody's 
proclivities, right? But I was I was amazed to discover now it's the, the pendulum's kind of swung back in the sense of people are still appreciating the physicality of things and people still do really read a lot and and not just my books uh you know um <clears throat> christians of course i do think read a lot but uh in general because i'm in in my world of of publishing i try to keep up with things and i find out that just there you know if you look at traditional publishing there they've been having some problems and issues and such um, but in terms of self-publishing authors, you know, it's just exploded. And as a whole, we are selling so many books, it blows my mind. And that, and that kind so. of leads to my neck, the other question that I was kind of uh, forgetting. Um, not only are, are independent publishers coming to the surface, but indie films are big. Yes. You know? Yeah. And yeah. Um, now we, when you think of an indie publisher that w made it big and then it resulted in a movie, you've got the shack to me that is i mean this thing was self-published before it was traditional published um yeah sound of freedom is the most recent you know okay yeah so we're seeing a lot of that and um did um did you ever think of going the indie route in terms of making a uh, cruel logic as a film yeah i have and i've tried to um but it's still but just haven't money, been successful right? yeah you still it's, need it's all, money yeah lots of money and now I think Cruel Logic could be a great uh, series, a uh, streaming series, actually. Uh, yeah, right. one season, one season series, but you know you can get a good eight to eight to nine episodes for a much richer story now, and that's that that's what I would like to see it as rather than a movie. But uh, yeah, so I, I do believe movies are very influential, highly, and 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 television, and in a way that's not even aware people people pick up the stuff and don't even know it. You know what I mean? Like, so they're right. watching, they're being, the point of it right. is the power of story is it, right, right. it draws you right. in with the entertainment value. You, you let yourself go. You follow with the hero, with the protagonist along their journey. You cheer them on, you root them on. And as the hero or the protagonist learns their lessons, so to speak in their story, you uh, in the as the audience because you're rooting for them you embrace it as well whether you agree you know, you think so or not and so that's the power of story and some would call that manipulative i don't it can be manipulative but no more manipulative than uh, logical arguments can often be manipulative too right <clears throat> sure. so so it can be manipulative or it can just simply be the power of human emotion and drama the way god created us right. which is why god used mostly story to communicate his truth right to us. right well, and, and we like, most of us at least, like good morality tales. Yeah. Whether it's film, book, whatever. We like good morality tales. However, as you point out, you start picking up other aspects of your worldview, say, through Star Wars, for example. Sure. Uh, love Star Wars. How much has that influenced culture toward Eastern mysticism, though? A lot. Sure. Uh, same thing when the Matrix first came out. It took my son to see the Matrix uh, because it gave me a great opportunity to talk about what is it that they're telling you about reality. It's a great story. It's fun. It's you know a lot of action. Uh, like the characters, mm -hmm. but it's not a Christian film. No. Uh, right. So what is it that they're telling you about but the world? In, in the final Matrix, you have Neo. He's dead. And he's laying on this plank, sort of, and there's a cross beam, and he's stretched out <laughs> like Jesus on the cross. And, of course, we know that he just died to free all those people. You know, I mean, it was right. clearly he was borrowing Christian. They were borrowing Christian imagery to tell a pseudo-Christian story. I mean, they, right. they yeah. both of the brothers who made the movie were really into Gnosticism. Yeah, they wrote, they'd studied it. So well, and Nietzschean, they actually are were self-proclaimed Nietzscheans. Um, okay. So they actually, and that's why they had no problem using religious imagery because they know. By the way, that's one of the. That's how, mm. um, and I write about this in several of my books: Hollywood worldviews, but also um, uh, the imagination of God and God against the gods. These are all books I've written that deal with the, the notion of subversion, how story subverts. Um, opposing worldviews. And what it, how it does that is you tell a story that uh, by using what is, you know, well-known or common 
in the marketplace or in the culture, you know, things that people are very familiar with, you use those images, those constructs, those uh, motifs, right? Um, and you tell your story, but you redefine those images with new meaning and you, what, whatever your meaning is. And so, yeah, in fact, I wrote um, an award-winning article on Matrix when it, when it first came out, you know, the oh. first two movies. And, and, and I, I tried to explain and show how they're using Christian imagery to subvert Christianity. And the, the salvation that was offered in the Matrix was self-salvation. So Neo was a Christ figure in the sense that he was the, sim, the emblem of what we all can be in saving ourselves, yeah. right? And, and they, they, the, the filmmakers actually admitted this. I mean, I, I read their interviews with them and such. Uh, they have no shame in it. You know, they, they actually believe, yeah, this, we're, we're subverting culture and stuff. But, but by the way, everyone does that. Even God does that, where you use, you use images right. and, you know, stories. Cultural even. elements, right. Yeah. So that's how, um, like, <clears throat> you, you know, we've heard, we've heard the, the latest outrage about all the woke uh, reinvention of stories, you know, whether it's the Snow White, you know, the, and some of them have caused trouble, sure enough, but some of them have not. And some of them are getting away with it. And so they normalize these bizarre queer lifestyles by just embedding them slowly into stories until they get normalized. And then we're laughing along with them. And then they're just part of normal life. And that normalizes bizarre things, but also they, they use, that's why a lot of movies have Christian imagery in it, in it. But like you're saying, you've got to be careful. People need to be careful. Sometimes they are indicative of Christianity, like the movie Braveheart, but sometimes they are not. They are, used to subvert Christianity. They're just using something you're familiar with. So you'll grab onto it and you'll be able to, to follow along with them. You know, this, the, yeah, this is the power and beauty of story. And I do that in my own stories as well. So for instance, you know, even in cruel logic, you know, I have, a um, I have, a uh, this kid coming into college and my goal is, is not to demonize, so to speak, the, the university and, and all these, uh, queer theorists and stuff. I wanted to capture them, what they really are and what might actually draw a young, naive freshman, what might actually manipulate them or draw them into that. What's, what's attractive to them? Cause I, I don't want to show my opponents in the worst possible light. I want to show them in the best possible light so people can get an idea of why people are being drawn into this. Right. But then as the story progresses, progresses, you see that those ideas that are in the beginning that seem to be attractive, ideas have consequences. And by the end of the story, you see that those ideas do not have uh, very positive <clears throat> consequences in the long I, run. Yeah. I, I'd like to see more uh, Christians, uh, particularly young Christians, but of any age, really, but uh, young Christians uh, influenced to, who want to influence culture with sound biblical truths and use storytelling as a vehicle. You know, I, I'd like to encourage them. And my, so I have some questions. If I were just starting out, I'd want to know, th I, I, I want to know like, okay, assuming I can write. Um, that's a big is, assumption. That's a big assumption, right? So you gotta, you gotta get some feedback, right? You know, you gotta try it out. You know, you might not be able to, when you start out, you might not be too good at it, but keep working at it, right? Um, over time, which is harder to try to uh, write a, a script for a screenplay or to write a novel? Which was harder mm -hmm. for you? Uh, a novel, uh, because there's a lot more detail. A script is very much more abbreviated. It's more plot driven. It's, you know, it's only uh, a two hour movie, which translates to about 120 pages. And those pages are full of a lot of white space because it's dialogue, yeah. most yeah. dialogue heavy. Whereas a novel obviously is not, and it goes into hundreds of pages. And mm. but but there is inter something interesting about the experience, um, and that is uh, so. I personally prefer writing movie scripts, um, but uh, I have followed my opportunities. God has presented a lot of opportunities. And I've gone down the path of a lot of novel writing because I've become very successful at it and reaching a lot of people with it. And so I, you know, rather than just clinging on to what I want, if I see God's blessing me and this is working well and it's helping people, I follow that pathway. Mm -hmm. And that's where I am right now, where I'm doing more novel writing than I am doing um, movie writing. Before it was more movies than So it's, than it's harder, but it's been more rewarding for you. In some ways, it's certainly more rewarding. Um, the, the thing about movies is 
the hardness of it comes in interacting with the people who have the power and the money. And um, so when you, when you create a story or write a screenplay script, of course, we must be humble enough to acknowledge that we're not perfect and we need help and it's good to get feedback. And so uh, the goal is, is to find creative people who understand story well and right. can give good feedback to challenge your story and make it better and stronger. And that right. often happens, but unfortunately mm -hmm. they're too often uh, people in, who have the money and the power aren't that good with story mm -hmm. and they are trying to force you to change things in a bad direction. And that's why a lot of movies end up really poor, but also it's a struggle as a writer. Cause you're like, Oh my gosh, how can I, how can I fulfill this, this demand that I know is wrong, but I got to try to make it work anyway, you know? And, um, that's, that's the downside of that world where, um, you, you are beholden to people who are not necessarily worthy of the authority to craft that story. So um, that's the the real negative side. The great side for me on novels is I I, I hire an editor to challenge me, and she she rips apart my stories, my really? first drafts. So like you know, but she's got the skills and she has the um, yeah the the um, the knowledge to do so. She has the right to do so, and it makes my my novels better. But nevertheless, um, you know, I have. I I spent years trying to get movies made and I've only got, a, I can count them on my hand, one hand. Right. And it was, it was worth it to me because I love movies, but, and I love making movies, but just pulling back and realizing, yeah. Um, I, I've written so many scripts that are Oscar winning scripts sitting on the shelf. You know, every screenwriter <laughs> will tell you that. Um, but all my novels, because I'm self published, all my novels get out there. So yeah. all I'm getting, I'm writing more stories, reaching more people than ever before, making more money than I ever had in Hollywood. Right. And, and, and the effect that like what you were indicating is there is a, a deep effect on people um, that has been very fulfilling for me as a storyteller. Yeah, I but remember, this is just, this is just my unique yeah. journey, you know, everybody well, oh, yeah, has different yeah. journeys. Well, but it's, it's interesting though, how many people, the, how their unique journeys are overlapping, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and how different they are from, like, what I was thinking when you talked about being self-published and being so successful at it, um, you know, it was like, I don't know, 20 years ago when self-publishing had, had a stigma. Oh, yeah. Right. In, in fact, it was called vanity publishing. Yeah. And um, and I don't... I, I, I don't hear that phrase anymore. People no, are making in fact, too much money. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and and not just it's not just the money, of course, but the money represents the audience. Right. And you know, we have we have authors like uh, Brandon Sanderson who writes sci-fi fantasy, and he puts up a Kickstarter uh, for his next three fantasy novels, and he raises over forty million dollars. Whoa! So it's like, Dude. and 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 there are self-published authors who could not get, including myself, who could not get an agent or could not get in the tra trad publishers, traditional publishers. And they are not only making more money, they're dominating the, the bestseller lists uh, above these self, these uh, traditional published authors. And we're making the higher profit that we deserve as authors and creators of our material. The, the pathetic royalties that you get from traditional publishing, 10% oh, yeah, 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 yeah. and less, <laughs> unless you're yeah. a celebrity. Yeah, but Don just sent me one of those pathetic uh, royalty checks, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so it's kind of funny where it's like, I mean, I'm making, you know, up to 70% royalty versus 8 to 10%, you know. And so there's many different levels in which self-publishing, thank God, has become... Uh, like you said, it's broken out of that stigma, you know, the stigma, the stigmatization, but there's also part of the problem, which is, well, thank God for the internet in that sense, it, which allowed us the ability to do that. But honestly, thank God for mm. Amazon. And I, you yeah, know, I know there's a lot of bad things that Amazon well, does, but, but those systems that enabled writers like me to be able to blow out and, and go full time and become a, a, a well-known author, yeah. Uh, I could never have done it without Amazon. Well, so, you know, so here we have a, a when I've, I self-published my master's thesis and about a month or two after I published it, I got a call from an adjunct professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. He wanted to know if he, I, I, who, who, who asks this question? Can I use your book in my class? It's like, 
Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, I mean, I, I yeah. went to grad school. I don't remember any of my professors saying, I made sure to get permission from all these authors before I put this on the, on the reading list. Uh, <laughs> so whatever, whatever, all it really helped me do is, is realize that, hey, you know, professors are reading this book and right. they're assigning it in class. You know, that's all it did. It didn't really make me a lot of money, although that was a year when I made probably more than usual. But what it, what this, what happened that enabled me to even do this in the first place was the technology. Yeah. You know, not only the digital technology of, of being able to submit this, my, my copy to an editor in Arizona right. who, who then, but, but then the, the, what the new, the new kind of publish on demand technology that allowed them to print a book like one at a time. Yeah. I mean, all this new now changed the have, world. It did. Now what's changed in the world. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on whether this will change the world of independent filmmaking, AI. Yeah. I mean, could we be seeing? Oh yeah. Oh no, it, it definitely is. It's probably and it's, there's happened. no going back. There's no going back. I mean, how it's make... going to affect it. I don't know. Cause I don't, I have not been studying the AI issue very it's, much. It's mind blowing. But it's yeah, mind I know. Blowing. I know. And, and even, even as a writer, it's going to be very, it's, um, it's, it's very helpful in many ways. And yeah, there's a lot of debates on it, but so what you're saying is technology helps to democratize access, yeah. but it's not always, but there's a couple things going on here though. Um, first of all, like, it, it, yeah, it saved the independence and the individualism that we need for a proper balance of society with the community and the individual because the individual had been completely squashed by big corporations and big systems, you know, like trad publishers, all the whatever, the top five big publishers owned everything. And and then they've gone woke. Yeah. So now you can't, you right. know, if, right. if you're sending a book in, even Christian publishers, like they would not take my, they would not take my novels because there's, you know, my Bible novels had too much sex and violence in them probably for them. And, and uh, like the Bible does. And, yeah. uh, but also just, you know, it's wild and, and they had never, they, they don't know what, yeah, to, anything that's yeah. truly new and unique, they're afraid they, of, and they don't know well, what they, to do they, with they, it. They'd never made money off of it before. That's right. really what I think. Until it becomes big, well, then, they, then you know, they jump in on it. Right, Brian, friend, you, you just touched on something that, that you and I talked about early on. Uh, and that is, uh, I tend to shy away from most Christian <clears throat> books because they are just too light. They don't have good character development. The characters are not real life kind of characters like you would find in the Bible. Yeah. So you have kind of run a risk of writing novels that include the way people actually behave. Yeah. Yeah. What, Absolutely. what caused you to say, I, I need to try to do this? Well, I, if, if I'm following you, um, so well, something you said earlier, um, Jesus smuggling about the, <laughs> no, about the craft. So one of the biggest oh. problems is the craft is not elevated to its proper priority for many Christians. In other words, Christians will see the arts, whether it's movies or books, writing, uh, as a means to an end. In, in that it's it's sort of like a way to embody a sermon. You know, their understanding of the arts right. is not really, it's not, I would argue it's not biblical, but but they they value, they do not value the craft, they value the message. And so the message is so when you value the message more than the craft, then um then of course what you'll have is the the poorly produced Christian movies that we see, poorly everything, because they're not putting their any energy into making the craft the best it can be because it, it's all about the message to them. And that's been one of the biggest problems with uh, Christian artists of all kinds, writers included. Uh, and I do think that that's been changing around in recent years because yeah, younger people do appreciate that more. But but am I suggesting the craft should be more important than the message? No, I believe they should be equally ultimate, just like in Christ, he is equally ultimate in terms of he's the image of the visible God and he's the actual dramatic embodied image of God, but he's also the, the logos, you know, the underlying order to the, to the visible universe. Well, you have to communicate a, a message that keeps people's attention first. Well, a message is, it, it, all good art is going to have a message, but right. the question is, are you valuing the craft as much as the message? And those right. who do 
create the better works of art that well, will have both message. Cause don't believe anybody who tells you like, you know, Oh, I'm not, you know, we're not doing messages. We're just doing entertainment. There's no such thing. Every, no, 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 all no, story, no, no, all no, art, all right. has embodied. That, well, what, what I would say is by valuing the craft, you're valuing the message. That would just be my way of, expl of expressing yeah. it because, sure. you know, if, if I don't, I, I have seen websites like this when the web was new websites with pretty interesting, important, maybe even, you know, worthwhile content that absolutely failed because there was no interest at all in making it even yeah. desirable to read and to look at. It was ugly. Yeah. And the same thing, you could take that same principle and apply it to Christian music, to Christian film, to Christian books. You, you need to, in fact, you, you read uh, Charles Spurgeon's lectures to my students. And, you know, he, he spends a lot of time talking about delivery, talking yeah. about, you know, your vocal inflection, your facial expressions, you know, the, these things were not lost on the 19th century preachers. They understood right. them. They had to stand up in a huge auditorium sometimes with no amplification and, and hold their listeners attention uh, for, you know, an hour or however long they did it. By the way, that's why I think um, a lot of uh, Christians and conservatives in this world are, have, are losing the cultural battle because um, they va we still value logic above all. And I'm not against logic. I'm not anti-rationality. I'm not postmodern. But right. when you, we have to realize that rhetoric is just as legitimate. And um, the, basically, the, <laughs> the bottom line is, is, is uh, um, in fact, I was just reading Christopher Rufo was, was talking about this very thing, you know, um, that... Uh, it, it's the rhetoric that's yeah. that's going to capture the hearts and my uh, hearts and souls of people, well, rhetoric, and that will trump right. logic. Rhetoric it will is, trump logic. Well, it is, right. it, rhetoric is simply the art of persuasion, persuasive speech, particularly. And you know, Paul said, "Knowing the fear of God, we persuade men." So he he was not at all. I mean, yes, he believed that it was God who ultimately did it. You know, it was not ultimately up to him, but that did not give him license to neglect his uh his his efforts at being persuasive at using good arguments at holding people's attention of yeah. being you know i hate to use the word winsome i think it's been i think it's been assigned to too high a priority in many cases but sure. you know he, he was all things to all people and that was a communication device and and look even though the postmodernism um does not believe in any ultimate truth or ultimate reality, right. they believe there is only story, right? So that they're, is the they're ultimate highly truth. relativistic, but yeah. nevertheless, there is a truth to that, that is story wins. So whoever tells the best story wins. Right, right, so right, as, right, right. So for me as a Christian, I want to still tell the best story but I want to be truthful and honest. But nonetheless, I focus on telling the well, best story because we that's have the, the best win. story. We have the best story. We do have the we, best story. We, we I want have to, the best story. <laughs> I want to go back. I mentioned earlier about going and teaching high school students that are prepping for college. The film I use is uh, Hildalgo. Uh, so and it's a oh, well yeah, done yeah, story. All right, it's a good. It's a well done story. Clearly laying out three worldviews for you to pick from. Uh, and you have to decide which is the the, the best worldview, the worst worldview, and the most honorable worldview. Uh, and so it's a well-told story, but it leads you to a a bad choice ultimately. Yeah. Now, I just and want people, to get that. people don't have to understand that, or even they don't even have to be aware of it to be right. affected by it. Is my point. Exactly. You'll ingest it emotionally. And it'll 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 change you even in ways you're not aware of it, which is why I think what you're doing is in teaching students how to look for it. That's that's what I did when I my book Hollywood Worldviews came out 25 years ago. It was one of the first books out there that did that that helped Christians to say, look, let's appreciate the stories, but let's try to figure out what's the worldview, what are they communicating, right. and when you have that discernment, you're more objective and you're more able to say, okay, this is what I like about it, this is what I dislike, and you're not going to be as easily manipulated as as someone and well, uh, as someone yeah. else who doesn't who doesn't really think about that, <clears throat> just ingest the entertainment. Ingesting I, the the word I most often use is uh, osmosis. Nearly everybody, most of their worldview comes by osmosis. It sort of yeah. filters in uh, the people you hang around with, the books you read, the movies you watch, all of that uh, filters in 
And then one day you wake up and you go, where did I get that idea from? And you can't even put your finger right. on it. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and they don't, yeah, and this is why I constantly hear people like, you know, and when they're talking about their beliefs and their ideas, and I'm like, you got that from television. You got that from watching movies. No, I didn't. It's like, <laughs> they're so ignorant, you know, this is, it's, it's a frustrating, it's frustrating, but, but look, here's, <clears> here's, so here's what I do in my stories, including crew logic. Um, I want to portray people. I, the story has a clear point of view, but yes. I want to be fair and honest in my portrayal. So uh, good <laughs> art will, will seek to show opposing viewpoints and show the best of opposing viewpoints, even though it's going to have a conclusion of its particular view of the storyteller. Right. Nevertheless, right. it seeks to, and this is what I try to do, is try to show people at their best, show them the best arguments, show them um, you know, all the atheists are not evil people and all the Christians good people. You know, And, and sadly, sometimes Christian stories suffer from this kind of a thing. Uh, I show a Christian... Um, you know, this Christian who's going to college, he's a very typical evangelical, and I show his sins as, as well. You know, one of the biggest sins in, in the church that is still covered up is pornography. And so I have this issue in that Christian's life as well. Um, and then I also have uh, one of my main characters is not a Christian, and, he, you know, he's one of the heroes. He's one of the guys right. fighting for truth. And right. so I try to, to keep that... Um, that the, the reality keeping of keeping it real, keeping it real. <laughs> it's you could call it well, some some might call multi perspectives or perspectivalism to a certain degree. What all that means is, is in terms of telling a story, it means being true to the various viewpoints and being showing them at their best so that the conflict that comes out of those characters will be rich and fulfilling when it concludes. And that's mm -hmm. what I sought to do with Cruel Logic and showing all these characters and all their beliefs and their worldviews make their best arguments or what have you. Um, yet nevertheless, I believe that ideas do have consequences and the violence that embod that occurs in the university with the student uprisings is really philosophically connected. That's what I was getting to earlier where the serial killer is the apex predator in a sense of the postmodern reality. And mm. it's, it's the one character that, you know, uh, yeah, of course you could put in their uh, sociopaths and psychopaths um, the point is, is they don't have a conscience. They they don't ha care about right and wrong. Um, and however you explain that, these are real beings who, who exist in our world. And if if your worldview does not provide a proper valid uh, 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 argument for morality, then the serial killer represents that embodiment of a right. world without ultimate without, mor morality right, rooted right. in a creator. Because right, now, we, there is no ultimate we, right and wrong. We're going to have to end. Uh, I, I want to ask you at some point, not <clears throat> immediately, but to come back. We need to have more discussion sure. like this because I, yeah. I think arts in the Christian life are really important as well. Yeah. Uh, Brian uh, Gadawa, uh, the book we tentatively were talking about is Cruel Logic, but we're really talking about more. And yeah. that is the importance of storytelling and truth. Both. Hey, look, look over his shoulder there. He's got him. <laughs> yep. Yep. I, I had a bigger version, but that works just fine. That's and great. we have it in the link below in the description. So go get the book and read it. It. Can I give I'm, you one? I'm getting one, it. Though? I, I yeah. just want because especially if you're Christians, um, because some Christians, um, you have to be aware though that this book shows evil and sin realistically. I try not to exploit it, I try to be like the Bible, but there is uh there are some F bombs, there's there's some violence and such. And so if right. you if you are very sensitive to that material, this may not be the book for you. So just right. be aware going in there, my purpose is not to to uh uh you know just okay. to whatever to exploit sin and 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 and, and imbibe in it. My point is to show evil as it really truly is otherwise the redemption that we are seeking to offer people will have no power if you don't accurately depict the evil that we're trying to redeem them from so just be aware that that it's a little harsh you know sometimes r rated at times um it, but uh, i promise it it it's a redemptive story just like the bible right right thank you
Ron, would you care to walk us out of here? Yes, I would. Let's give credit to whom credit is due. Our resident cult leader profiler is Neil before me. Our wardrobe manager is See How It Fits You. Culinary services are provided by Chef Ham and Cheese. Our tinfoil hat provisioner is Just In Case. Jehovah's Witnesses coverage comes from Armageddon and The Opposer. Our Mormon archives manager is Polly Gummis. Our liberal denominations bureau chief is Lucy Goosey. Our transgender issues coverage comes from Ben Hur. Special correspondent for Cult Space Based on the Hindenburg disaster and flying turkeys, oh, the humanity. Our fact-checking supervisor is Jolie Pulling. Technical assistance comes through Murphy Research. Our legal advisors are the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Our grievance resolution director is Giovanna P. Sami. Director of Privacy Assurance comes from Wiretapping. And original idea sourcing comes from Drew A. Blank. The Unknown Webcast is a production of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in cooperation with Emergency Manicure Productions, both of whom are solely responsible for this content, but you will never be able to prove that in a court of law. Never, never, you'll never. Notice, you'll notice I changed the copyright date, Don. I, I don't know. I did remember. notice that. I was going to have to remind you, but I see no, you No, no, you did not have to. This one year, this is the first time I remembered. How, how long have we been doing this? I don't know. Uh, like seven years now. Wow. Uh, okay. All right. Thank so you, Brian. Adios. Thanks for having me, guys.